Thank you. Welcome back, students. <laughs> Welcome to the classes where we, we learn about the body and its inbuilt ability to heal itself. And this morning we looked at poultices and compresses, different things that you can apply to the body to stimulate a healing process. We looked at Psalm 104 verse 14 where the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. They're to serve you. They're to work with your body systems to bring about a healing process. But tonight I want to look at water. And water has been used for centuries, probably even more than centuries. And water can be used in three ways. There are whole textbooks written on water therapy. So what I want to do tonight is I want to give you the basic principles and then I want to show you a few different ways that you can use them. So first of all, we need to, we need to look at the properties of water, what it can do and how we can use it. Water can be used as a liquid and that of course is water. And it can be used as a solid and the solid is ice. It can also be used in a gas form, and that gas form is steam. And I have mentioned previously, um, we looked at the liver and the way it detoxes earlier in the week. We looked at the four organs of elimination, and we looked at the skin and how it's a powerful organ of elimination in its ability to throw off waste. That up to 70% of body's waste can be eliminated out of the skin when it's given the right conditions. And one of those conditions is the steam sauna. And so there's a couple of places where you use gas, water as a gas, which is steam, and that is the steam sauna. You can get dry saunas and you can get wet saunas, and the wet saunas are where you use the steam. Even with a dry sauna, there's often hot rocks there and you can throw water on and it'll It'll bring up the steam and the steam, as it heats up the body, it also penetrates into the body. And with the steam bath that we use at Misty Mountain, it's a wood-fired steam bath and we've got it down by the creek so that our guests can, can have a steam sauna and then go into the creek and then back into the, into the sauna. They usually do that three times. There's only one part of the body that does not like getting hot, and that is the head. So our guests always have a little bucket of cold water with a face cloth, a washer in it, so that they can keep their, their head cool. And the only time someone may struggle with breathing would be someone who has asthma. If someone has pneumonia, if someone has bronchitis, then breathing in the steam can open the bronchioles. But if someone has asthma and they breathe in that steam, it can irritate and further close up the little bronchioles. So if someone has asthma and they're going into the steam, we suggest that they breathe through the, the face cloth so that they're not taking that, that hot air into the, into the lungs. Usually by the third steam, the body temperature can be, so we say 40 degrees centigrade, that's getting up to I think over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So what are we basically doing with these people? We're creating a fever. <laughs> and a fever is a remarkable process in the body. So let me show you a few things about fever. Because a lot of people fear fever. But fever is actually your friend. Why is fever your friend? Because God created fevers and fevers have a purpose. So what's the purpose of a fever? When the body temperature rises up to approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then all body systems are speeding up. So blood circulation speeds up. That means throwing off the waste. 
speeds up and if blood circulation speeds up through the body, the cleaning and functioning of the body all speeds up, which means healing accelerates. But there's something else that the fever does. If there are any harmful pathogens in the body, the fever, the high heat of the fever, can actually burn them. The body can cope with a fever as long as the body is well hydrated. So when our guests are preparing for the steam sauna at the end of the day, I say to them, the only time you'll have trouble in the steam is if you go into the steam in a dehydrated state. And you can't hydrate your body just before the steam. So you start early, you start as soon as you wake up, little by little by little by little through the day. I mentioned how God sends the rain on the earth in a little sprinkles. Well, apparently that's not happening in the southern states at the moment. In fact, as I walked out of the hotel, I saw on the big screen that there was a, was a tornado warning. Oh, they're, they're getting big blasts of water. And those big blasts of water can be destructive. So, so whenever a person is doing water treatments on the body, it is vital that the body be well hydrated. And to hydrate the body, little by little by little, ideally at least eight glasses over the day, we say to our guests, try and have even more water than that because at the end of the day, with the three steam saunas at the end of the day, they're usually in the steam sauna for about 10 minutes. They're losing a lot of, uh, a lot of moisture. In fact, when I'm in the steam sauna, I usually wait until, until the drops are dripping off my fingers. <laughs> Is that just perspiration? It's some perspiration, but it's also the steam, just the steam build up on the body. So fever is your friend, and fever has been used for centuries, especially in uh, clinics across Europe, and also there's the very famous Battle Creek Sanitarium in the mid-1800s where Dr. Kellogg was the medical director there. Did you know that at one point they had a 1,000 beds? Imagine a health retreat with a 1,000 beds. He did have a small part where he would do surgery, but I was reading an autobiography of a Dr. Brown, and Dr. Brown, she worked with Dr. Kellogg way back then. And she said he was a very good surgeon, but he rarely used surgery. He would do everything possible before he would resort to surgery. So isn't that nice? It's using a whole, all the natural remedies. And if you get a response, the body's saying, yes, yes, we can do this. Also, there's the canipe water cures. Um, nurses used to study the, the canipe water cures. I have the textbook. It's canipe's hydrotherapy for nurses, hydrotherapy being water therapy. And one of the water therapies was to produce a fever because fever is your friend. It gives an incredible healing boost to your body. So not only does healing increase, not only does blood circulation increase, which means more oxygen, more nutrients all through the body, more waste being thrown off, but the bone marrow is stimulated to produce more white blood cells and more red blood cells. And remember that water puts the fire out. And so this water can be used externally and water internally. So obviously internally that's um, drinking, but there's another place that water can be given uh, internally and that is as an enema. And often when a person has a fever, sometimes maybe they vomit and so you think, how are we going to get the water in now? Well, there's another place you can put the water and that is as an enema. So if a body's dehydrated and you take it to the hospital, they'll put a drip in. And how does the drip go in? Drip, drip, drip. But when you give an enema, you can get a cup and a half, sometimes two cups of water in like that. So it hydrates the body much quicker. And sometimes when a person is dehydrated and you give them an enema, uh, no water comes out. That's because the body's just, just taken it up. 
Another way also that you can hydrate a dehydrated body, if the person can't, can't drink, maybe they're vomiting, maybe they're nauseous, sometimes just sucking on ice, so they're just getting little bits. But if you lay them in a bath, if they're very dehydrated, the skin will access the water and draw it in through the, through the skin. The skin is, is very much what we use in hydrotherapy. The skin absorbs. The skin also uh, breathes. And the skin also throws off waste. But there's something else that the skin does, and this is very much what we use in hydrotherapy. It has its senses. And so whenever I'm doing a, a water treatment on someone, I use my hand to sense the heat. And I also know that different people can handle different heat, so I usually get the person to put their hand in. How, that feels okay with me. How does that feel for you? Hands are right. Actually, let's try the feet. How does that fe feel for you? And if I'm putting someone's foot in a, say, a bucket of hot water, I always put their foot in my hand so that my hand touches the water first and then their foot goes in and I watch their face. <laughs> I watch their face. And you can tell straight away. And that's what we learned as a nurse. You, you read the body language more than you read the mouth because some people want to want to be brave some people want to tell you what they think you want to hear but the the body language it's like if you get a reaction you take it straight out yeah just make it a bit cooler and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute so it's the skin that that we really use with with uh, with water therapies now water puts the fire out that's water internally but also water externally so there are a few things that you can do um, to help put the fire out. But do you want to put the fire out if fever has a purpose? What I used to do with my children if they got a fever is I used to just bring it down to where it was comfortable. I never took a temperature. I used to just put my hand on their, on their neck. Ooh, <laughs> that's very hot. <laughs> And usually when someone's very, very hot, they're very uncomfortable. So what you want to do is you just want to bring it down so that the body's comfortable. And there's a few water treatments that you can use to do that. One of the problems with a fever is, is the body can't get rid of the heat quick enough. So when you're doing a water treatment, you're doing a treatment that will help pull the heat out of the body. So probably one of the simplest is to put the person in a tepid bath. This is lukewarm. This is not hot and this is not cold. Because you put very cold water on a feverish body, you, you can actually push that heat in, whereas you want to pull it out. So if you have a tepid bath, not hot, not cold, lukewarm, and you put a very hot body in there, it'll feel a little cool, but it won't be uncomfortable like cold would be. And if you take the temperature of that water before you put the person in, and maybe you leave them there for 10 minutes and then take the temperature of the water again, it's going to be hotter than when you put that person in because one of the amazing properties of water is its ability to hold hot and cold. And what it'll do is it'll draw the heat out of the body. Now I found that when you've got a little one, maybe a little three-year-old or two-year-old or one-year-old, they want you to cuddle them. They don't want to go in the bath because <laughs> they're feeling miserable, they're feeling sick, and, and if they cry, they get hotter. So there's another thing that you can do, and that is a wet sheet back. Now this is a little bit more serious treatment. It's the most effective, and when you first apply it, the child will not like it. And that is wrapping them up in a wet sheet. And so if you're going to do it to an adult, you, um, you have a, a table, like it might be on a bed. If it's on a bed, it might be a single bed, you'll put a plastic sheet over it because you don't want to wet the, wet the bed. Or you could use a massage table. 
And we're going to look at the massage table from, we're looking at it end on. So what you will do is you'll put a woolen blanket. Now, it must be a woolen blanket. It cannot be any other fabric. Because if it's a cotton blanket, as soon as it gets wet, the, the air goes on that and it'll chill, but not wool. So you have a look at the, the sheep in Australia with their woolly coats. When it rains, what does the rain do? It just runs off. <laughs> so it, it, the wool is very good at insulation. And then you wring out a wet sheet and then you put the wet sheet over that. And even if you make it warm by the time you've wrung it out and placed it over the woolen blanket, it's, it's cold. <laughs> and then you lay the person on that. And best if they've got as least clothes on as possible. So just maybe a pair of underpants. And how you wrap the wet sheet is you wrap one side, then the other side. And so the first side, they've got their arms up in the air, the legs apart, so the first wrap goes between the legs and under the arms. Then you get them to close their legs, put the arms down, and then you pull the other sheet way over the top, way over the top. Now, if you can imagine, you're touching every surface area. And then very quickly, you pull the woolen blanket on. And as soon as the woolen blanket is on the wet sheet, it's now comfortable. <laughs> So the hardest bit is laying the hot body on that wet sheet. But if you explain it to the person first, what you're going to do, and even have someone to help you so it can happen really, really quick, because as soon as that woolen blanket's on, they relax, because this hot body warms that wet sheet up very quickly. In fact, often within five, ten minutes, you can put your hand down into the wet sheet and it will be hot. But if you're taking temperatures, you will find within about 10 minutes the temperature has come down because that wet sheet has pulled that heat out of the body. And often the person will relax and often fall asleep. So what do you do if they fall asleep in the wet sheet pack? You just let them, <laughs> let them sleep there. But often they only have to be in the wet sheet for maybe 10, 15 minutes and by then a lot of the heat has been pulled out they can get out, have a tepid shower, not hot, not cold, and often they go to bed and they'll sleep because they're, they're feeling a little bit better because the edge of the temperature has been reduced a little bit. So how do you do this to a baby? They will not like it, but they don't want to be away from you. They don't want to be in the bath. They want to be cuddled by you. So you get a wet sheet, wring it out, just a little one, and then you have a little soft woolly blanket, and you just even have their, their diaper on or even nothing on. And then you quickly wrap them up. You don't worry too much about in between the legs and under the arms, you can just be quick. And then, and then they'll scream because <laughs> it's wet. And then you'll quickly wrap the blanket on them and then you can hold them. And then they're very happy because that's what they want. They want to be close to you, they want to be held by you. And if you've got them wrapped up in a wet sheet, Oh, then you know, well, I can cuddle them and that sheet's pulling, pulling the heat out. So as you can imagine, that's a little uncomfortable to administer, but if you do it very, very quickly, the discomfort is, is very, very brief. But it is actually the most powerful way to reduce a fever. And remember, what you want to do is you just want to reduce it enough so the person is comfortable and always keep the cool on the head and always sip, sip water, suck on ice, but just little by little keep that body hydrated. A lot of people get scared when a little one, maybe a little two, three, one year old, um, gets a high fever because they think they're going to convulse. But if that little one is well hydrated, they will not. So keep them well hydrated. I used to let my little ones breastfeed as much as they want when they had a fever. <laughs> they could just feed and feed and feed and feed. Now, usually I had breaks between feeds, but when they were sick, they wanted to suckle because they, they didn't feel good, but I knew they were, getting, they were getting lots of fluid. Sometimes coconut water, 
they'll be happy with coconut water because it's a little bit sweet and that's the water from the immature coconut and it's very high in minerals because they're perspiring a lot, they're losing some minerals. A little bit of salt with the water, that can all help. So that the wet sheet pack is a, another, well it's probably one of the best ways to get the fever mm -hmm. down. And sometimes one wet sheet pack is enough. Uh, sometimes you might do it every six hours, something like that. Whenever a person gets a little bit too hot, then quickly wrap them in the wet sheet. Now, once the wet sheet's finished, that wet sheet needs to be washed because the perspiration that's coming out of the person has a lot of often toxic waste in it. So it's important that that wet sheet back be washed once it is moved. Use. So if you do another one six hours later, then you, you do a clean sheet. There is another way that is also a little bit more comfortable when a little one, maybe we're looking at a, at a four, five, six, seven, eight year old around that age, you have them in as little clothes as possible, maybe just their underpants, and you lay them on a towel. And then you lay a towel over them. And then you have a bowl of water, not hot, not cold, just tepid. And then you pull their arm out and you don't wring that face cloth out hard. You have it with a bit of moisture in it and you sponge the arm. And as those droplets of water sit on the skin, it's pulling heat out. And then you dry it and then you put the arm under. And if you feel those two arms, you'll feel a reduction in temperature in that arm. Then you'll do the other arm and put that under. Then you'll do a leg. Then you'll do the other leg. And then you'll do the torso. And then you turn the, the child over and you sponge the whole back. Once you've done the whole body, often that temperature is brought down a bit. So water puts the fire out. There's a few ways that water can be used just to bring that temperature down so it's comfortable. And that's tepid water, you're doing the sponge bath That's right. The third point to remember with the fever is that when all the trash is burnt up, the fire goes out. And one of the problems today, and I know this is what we're taught as nurses, that um, if anyone had a fever, we had, to, we had to stop that fever straight away. We, we would give them uh, Panadols, um, like um, analgesic drugs, Tylenol, to get that fever down. So it's, it's almost as if we were taught that the fever's an enemy, we've got to get it down, we've got to get it down. But fever has a purpose. So one man, he's from Romania, you know, he's very, very concerned about his child, he dialogues me with me often, and he said, the child's got a fever. And often when a child is teething, they can get a fever. We went straight to the emergency, they gave the child Tylenol, Every time the, the drug wears off, the fever comes back. He said, I can't sleep at night. You know, this has been going on for three days. What am I going to do? I don't want to give my child a drug. I said, I never gave my child a drug. There's no need. I said, your, the fever has a purpose. It is your friend. Just keep the child well hydrated. Let them sip, sip, sip. Water puts the fire out, just keep them cool. Keep the head cool, try a tepid bath. Sometimes even just a foot bath can bring the, the uh, heat down to the feet. Not a cold, hot foot bath. Well, not a cold foot bath and not a really hot foot bath, but just a warm foot bath. And I said to this father, when all the rubbish or the trash is burnt up, the fire will go out. You've got, you've got to follow this. You've got to let it take its course. It's there for a reason. Within 24 hours, the, the fever was gone. He was so happy. <laughs> so he actually delayed his, his little child's healing by keeping giving the drug to, put the, <laughs> to take this fever down because the fever has a purpose. And all through Europe, Fevers have been produced for centuries to stimulate healing in the body. At Misty Mountain Health Retreat in Australia, we give people fevers every afternoon. <laughs> they have the steam sauna every afternoon. Is a dry sauna okay to use if a person can't take a steam sauna? Is 
they're, well, they're advocating these dry sauna tent type things for like. Well, what, what, what we find is the steam sauna, the body can take it much better than the dry sauna because we're, uh, we're mostly water. We're 75% water from the neck down. We're 85% water from the, from the neck up. And you can get steam saunas, and I find that the steam saunas are the ones often that go from the neck. But we have a little hut, and it can sit eight people my size or six people a little bit larger uh, in, our, in our steam sauna. The other, the other fever that can be produced is not just a steam sauna, but also in a, um, a fever bath. And there are some health retreats that use fever bath to get the, to get the body temperature up very high to help fight cancer. So the fever bath, and again, that can be changed. I have seen, we had a, a big German guy who was 40. He could not handle it very hot. Then we had a tiny little lady who was only about 100 kilos, and she, she could handle it much hotter than this big German guy. So I never, there's no absolute rule here. It's just what the body can cope with. So for the fever bath, fever bath can be used for a few, few reasons. Fever bath can be used for, uh, to conquer a cold. So you might have a cold but you don't have a fever, well you might want to create a fever to just get through your cold quicker. Remember this morning I said I went to bed with the onion on my feet when I had the cold and I, I, uh, I had quite a fever that night. I was very, very glad when I had the fever because often that, that can uh, turn the tide of your cold. It'll, you'll heal so much quicker if you get a fever. And so when mothers email me and say, my child's got a fever, I always, I always email back and say, fantastic. It's a great thing. Fe fever is a good thing. Because we've been taught that it's an enemy. But when you think about it, it has a purpose. You remember that verse, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7? God says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. A sound mind considers what I'm telling you. A sound mind considers that for centuries, steam saunas, fever baths have been used to stimulate a healing process in the body, to stimulate the bone marrow to produce more red and white blood cells. So if they have a fever and they're shaking, that's you never put them in a cold bath. Then you would put them in, uh, you could do the wet sheet pack on them, which they will not like. But remember, as soon as that blanket's on around them, then the wet sheet pulls up. And often when they're shaking, again, it's the body can't get rid of the heat quick enough. So it could be a tepid bath. It could be a, uh, a wet sheet pack. So... Um, what, whatever the body responds to, but you've got to try and get that heat out. Sometimes when someone has a fever and they're shaking like that, you'll find their feet are cold. And so putting their feet in warm water, and as it warms up, you can put a little hot in and you can actually have their feet in hot water. And that can reduce the fever because it'll pull the heat down to the feet. So again, you're looking at you're looking at always looking at the body's response. Now, how would you create the fever bath? How would you create the fe fever bath by putting the person in a hot bath? So fever bath. Why would you do the fever bath if someone had a cold? And what you can do is put them in the bath. You can't put a cold body in a hot bath. So you make it a temperature that they can handle and then little by little you have the hot tap off and you bring it up. And when someone is using the fever bath for cancer, they might try and maintain that heat for half an hour. Some people can't handle half an hour. If they can only handle uh, for 20 minutes, so be it. But you keep the, the cool on the head. And also, it's been an effective treatment for Lyme's disease. 
And ideally with Lyme's disease, that's half an hour. In fact, one treatment for Lyme's disease is to have half an hour fever bath every day for 30 days. And we've seen some people um, that it's turned the tide because that high heat kills those little microorganisms that are causing the limes. And the lady that I met that was doing the treatment for limes, she said that when she'd been in there for half an hour, she just put the cold tap on and she just slowly, slowly let the temperature of the water come down. And that might take, you know, five, ten minutes. And she'd take the plug out, let the hot out, then slowly, slowly let it come down. So it was probably about a tepid bath and that would bring her body temperature down. Remember, the only part of the body that does not like getting hot is the brain. So you're always keeping the cool water on the brain. And we found when they were in the fever baths that the ears would get very hot and they just loved it when we put cold water on the ears. And sometimes you have to keep changing it, keep changing it. And remember, that, that cool cloth will pull the, pull the heat out. So is there something you can do if someone doesn't really run a temperature, if their, their core is usually around like 97, 97.5, and it doesn't go a lot higher than that? And that's, uh, what, are they having a fever bath and that stays well, at that? I'm just saying if they don't really ever run a fever, even if they're feeling bad, but, and I would be that person, they don't yeah. really ever run a fever. Um, I guess maybe your body doesn't need a fever. So it was in January 2021 that a double vaxxed guest um, got came in with COVID and gave COVID to half the staff and half the other guests. And I know when I got it, I had a very bad headache for a day and then I had a high fever for two days. I, I can't even remember the last time I had a fever. You know, maybe it was 10, 12 years ago. So you just go with the body and, uh, and people say to me, what did you do? I did absolutely nothing. I just slept a lot, drank a lot of water and ate hardly anything and I just let it run its course because fever has a purpose. One lady said, I'm just getting over COVID and I'm so tired. I said, yeah, so was I. I found that if I laid down for half an hour, I could do something for 10 minutes. Next day, if I laid down for 10 minutes, I could do something for half an hour. So just little by little by little. And that's what one man said to me. His mother just had a fever for three or four days and now she's so weak. I said, yeah, that's right. It's a huge thing that the body goes through to have a fever. So you recover. Remember that four-letter word? It's called time. Remember my daughter Emma? She said she was going to grow up in a minute. We want to be better in a minute. You just got to follow the body. If the body wants to rest, let it rest. So these are some of the areas you can use the fever bath. And remember, fever has a purpose. It's there for a reason. So if someone comes to us and we do a live blood analysis and we don't see hardly any white blood cells, why don't they have white blood cells? Maybe they've had a recent uh, course of antibiotics. See, antibiotics don't work with your body. They actually wipe out your white blood cells. They wipe out your, your gut flora. Maybe they've just had chemotherapy, which also wipes out your white blood cells. But at the end of the week, after they've been having steam saunas every day, we do another live blood analysis and their white blood cells are up to normal because of the fever baths or the steam sauna baths that we give them which are like a fever bath because that high heat stimulates the bone marrow to make more white blood cells and more red blood cells. So we'll have another, so we've just looked at water, how you can use water for a fever. What about ice? Ice is the most powerful anti-inflammatory that we have. And we forget about it. Anti-in. A 
And at the side of the football field, you don't have buckets of hot water. What do they have? Buckets of ice. <laughs> so if there's an injury, the, the, ice can be, the, the ice can be applied. So if someone has an itch, you know the best thing? Ice. You know the worst thing? Scratch. If you have an itch and you scratch it, It'll feel good while you're scratching it, but when you finish scratching it, what, how does it feel now? More itchy. More itchy. And what also do you see now? More inflammation. And maybe you've scratched it so much that maybe the skin's starting to break. But the best kill, kill for an itch is ice. There's nothing better. So when I was in Alabama a few years ago, I walked through the, the forest to get to the health centre every day. And after a couple of days, I noticed that I had a few itches. So I had about six bites on me, some on the legs, some on the torso. But they were itching, you know, they, the itching didn't stop. And I said to the staff, what are these bites? And they said, chiggers. <laughs> now, I've never heard of chiggers. <laughs> and they're, apparently they're little mites that get in. And they said, you'll be scratching for three weeks. So I decided to prove them wrong. <laughs> I decided never to scratch. So how did I do that? I iced it. So there's only two times that they'd get really itchy, and that was after my morning exercise. Because when you exercise, you increase the circulation of the blood and the circulation of the blood increases to the itchy bites and they get itchy. So I'd race home, I'd um, have a hot shower, finish with cold, but that still wasn't enough and then I just got a block of ice. And the rule of thumb with ice is uh, seven seconds on, seven seconds off. <coughs> When you're up to seven seconds, uh, it's very painful. Then you quickly take it off. And then I'd go to another one, seven seconds. Get very painful, then I'd go to another one. And I, I think I went through every itch bite, maybe twice. So I froze them twice. It took about, I don't know, 10 minutes. And then I would have no itch all day. And then at the end of the day, I'd have my hot shower and ah, uh, the itch had come again. So I'd spend 10 minutes before I went to bed icing them, icing them all. And then I'd sleep all night. So I only had to ice them twice in a day. And after 10 days, I had no chicka bites. And they couldn't believe it. They said, we've never seen it recover so quickly. That's because I didn't scratch. But you ice it. And ice it brings almost instant relief. It's it's incredible. Yes? What was their cure? Pardon? What was their cure? They didn't have scratch. Scratch, scratch for three weeks. Scratching doesn't work. Anyway, my. Did you actually put the ice cube on the. Straight on the bite. Straight on it. My daughter looked up on the internet and it said nail polish. Yeah. I'm not interested in putting nail polish on the body. Now, before I came away, I left Australia in late April. And in late April, I was working in the garden and my sons were there and I felt a little stingy on my back. And that's usually a tick. So I said to my son, have a look at my back. 30 ticks <laughs> were on my back, but they were the size of a pinhead really, really tiny. Anyway, he got most of them off and then it got to the point if I felt one that I think he missed, I'd just get the shaver and just shave the body off. They're just so tiny. Well, they're not going to live long without a body. But can you imagine how sometimes, well, the first night I was okay, but the second night, oh, woke up at two in the morning and it felt like my back was just crawling. So I went and got the ice. A bit hard, but you know, when you exercise and do your arm exercises, you actually get quite good at, and I can just about cover my whole back. And it took me about 10 minutes, and I think I went through three blocks of ice, just freezing every one of them. 
Took me about 10 minutes and at the end of that, no itch at all. It's just incredible. It's a miracle cure. <laughs> but we underestimate the wonders of ice. And then I went to bed and I lay in bed thinking, nothing, no drug, no drug on the planet could, could do that. My back felt like it was crawling with ants. It was just, ah. So in the morning, on my morning walk, it would, it would also get a bit itchy, but I've got a creek. So at home, on my morning walk, I dive in the creek. So I just, usually I'm not in the creek for long, but, when, but with this, I just laid in the creek till I could feel that was all dark, numbed. It just numbed all of them on my back. I really only had to ice probably twice, but if I'd scratched them, I, I would have had trouble for weeks. Yes? This morning you talked about compresses for uh, bites. Why did you choose not to do that? What happens when you put a compress on the bites is it heats up. And what, hap and what happens when it heats up? It gets even more itchy. But when it's a poison, now these weren't lime, bites. They didn't have limes in them. So my understanding is you know if it's got limes in it because it gets a red bullseye, is that right? Yeah, but you don't know it right so, away. So what you could do is you could ice it and then if you see any swelling at all then you put the charcoal on. So um, with the chigger bites Anything that heated, it would start to get itchy. With the, these tick bites, anything that heated, it would start to get itchy. So the ice was the best thing. So this is a good illustration of looking at the response. Also, if someone has eczema or psoriasis, that gets really itchy. You can't put any poultice on that because it heats up and then it gets itchier. But you can ice it. You can ice it. Now that won't cure it, but it'll just bring great relief. What will cure eczema and psoriasis is stopping the five allergens. And we have seen so many people, babies, toddlers, adults, totally cover from psoriasis. Takes about two months because they've got to stop the five allergens, dairy, wheat, oats, peanuts, refined sugar. If someone stops for a month and then has a slice of bread, well, they're back to, sp to square one. So what I say to people is, is get the cupboards ready. Get the cupboards, throw everything out that you can't eat, replace it with all the things that you can eat, and then start and put a, put a note on the, on the calendar. And what we find within two months, then, then it is cleared. That's easy, isn't it? And if a mother's breastfeeding, then she has to stop those foods. And we have seen many babies recover from, from uh, eczema by, by stopping that. But meanwhile, when it gets very itchy, you, you can ice it. So ice is excellent for any form of inflammation. When I was in Sweden last June running a health school, there was a lady there and she was in her 60s and she had a very wide scar on her knee. And I knew that that wide scar meant she'd had several operations, because every time you open a scar, that, oh, it, it gets bigger. And she told me that when she was only 16, she'd, she was in a very serious car accident. She'd been thrown out of the car and her girlfriend had been killed in the accident. So it was a very serious accident. And she'd had about six operations on her knee. So she's now in her in her 60s. And one morning she came in and, well, I came in and I saw her there and there were a few ladies around her and, and she was crying. And I said, what is it? And she said, I've been walking through the forest half the night. My leg is so painful. My leg is so painful, my knee. She said, and my husband wants to go home because I can't stop crying. And one of the students was a doctor and another couple of, and they had a big block of ice just sitting on the knee. You know, that's a very uncomfortable way to apply ice. <laughs> and I took the ice off and I put my hand on her knee and say this is her knee here. 
and there's this big scar right across. It was about that, that wide and I felt right in one spot there, it felt like a, a fire. It was very, very hot just in that one spot. Now what happens if you put ice on it, that can actually push that inflammation back in. Now this, this is not for the chigger's bite, that's just reducing it, but this is a bony knee and this is right inside. And I knew we had to pull that heat out. So I took the ice away and I got a bowl of cold water and a face cloth and I laid it over. And within 10 seconds, that was hot. So where's the heat come from? It's come from inside the knee. So I did it again and I did it again. And I must have done it 20 times. And by the time I'd done it the 20th time, when I put my hand on there, there was no more heat. You see the, what the water had done in this case? It had actually pulled the inflammation out. And the lady started smiling. What does a smile tell you? Relief. Now while I'm doing this, she began to cry again and I held her. Because sometimes you'll find when someone has been through a previous injury, the the situation around the injury arises and her, her best girlfriend died in that. So sometimes you need to comfort the person and soothe them. And she was very upset because her husband said they had to go if she didn't stop crying. <laughs> he didn't know what to do. So we were able to get the inflammation out of that knee with the cold cloths. So you see what we're looking at? We're looking at response. And when I came and saw that block of ice, and this is a rounded knee and a big block of ice just sits on top. And I knew when I felt that fire in a knee. In fact, I said to the students, feel this knee. You feel it. It's just in one point. I said, we're going to draw that heat out. And so what the cold cloths did is they drew the heat out. And sometimes if someone has a, a bone injury or a deeper injury, ice can be too painful. But these cold cloths drew it out. Now I was reading in a book called The Story of Our Health Message by Robinson that that was one of the first hydrotherapy treatments ever used. You don't have to have steam. You don't have to have boiling water. You All you have to have is water. And if you, can't, if you don't have a fridge or ice, you just keep changing the water every time it, every time it heats up. And then I saw that lady's whole body relax. And then she got up and started walking. Now you know what we could do now? We could put a ginger poultice on that now. And the, but I wanted, I wanted to get relief very, very quickly. And especially when I felt, I felt that it's like a fire inside her knee. <laughs> we wanted the water to, to pull it out. So you can see you've got water therapy, but you've also got poultices. And you've also got the situation, um, what can be done on, on the person and what you can do with the person. And I also saw that this lady was hurting and she didn't want to leave the health school early. So there's a whole, there's emotional issues around there too. And everyone that was watching that day saw how powerful cold cloths, that's it, just the a cold ginger, cloth. With the ginger poultice on there, like Further pain prevention or uh, what the ginger poultice would do, it would further, it would further pull it out. Yeah, but we'd we'd done a fairly good job just with the cold cloths. Yes. Can you do anything with people that have bone on bone, arthritic knees and bone on bone? Bone on bone, the castor oil compressors are very effective for that, and there is another herb called comfrey. And comfrey does three things. Comfrey is, uh, <clears throat> reduces inflammation and comfrey, I don't know whether inflammation has one or two M's but anyway, and comfrey also contains a lubricant. So it's rich in emollients which means it can help with bone on bone because it puts a lubricant in. Is this a tea or a topical? 
I'll tell you in a minute, and it also contains a growth stimulant. So how, there's a couple of ways that you can, and if you've got bone on bone, you want to put it straight on the knee because that target's right where it is. So in the winter, you use the root because all the healing properties go into the root, and in the summer, you use the leaves. Can it help grow a disc back if you had a neck injury? Can it help uh, grow a disc back? It's worth a try. But remember what I said the other day, when you start exercising and you strengthen the, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments that are holding that bone in place, because you're exercising, causing more blood to the muscles, ligaments, tendons, that nourishes the bone and they've even seen grown both. That didn't make sense. Bone growth. <laughs> grown both. That's a good one. Bone growth with uh, just from exercise because what you're doing is you're getting more blood into the area and more blood means more nutrients, more oxygen, more, more water, more white blood cells and you can certainly try the, the, comfrey, the comfrey cream. You can use it in the winter as a, as a grating up the root in the summer, pulverising up the leaves, as long as you get that juice coming out so the juice penetrates. Or you can use comfrey cream. So you could apply comfrey cream a couple of times a day. So we had a, a lady who, um, who had hurt her knee. And this lady, this is at our retreat a few years ago, she's a very large lady and Often when people are carrying excess weight, the knees aren't happy. And, and so she was, her knees weren't happy anyway, but she'd, she'd strained the knee and it was swelling up. And so what I did, the same treatment I just explained to you that I used on this lady, bowl of cold water and a washer. And just put it on as soon as it's heated up. Again, as soon as it heated up, you just keep changing it, keep changing it. And every time you take it off, where has that heat come from? It's come from the knee. Yep. And you can get the you can get the knee quite cold just by quickly changing those cloths. You might do it ten times, you might do it twenty times. And most pain is due to inflammation. So if you can get the inflammation down, you can get the pain down. So if ever I have pain anywhere in my body, the last thing I think of is a painkiller. I never think of that. I think, why is that pain there? What can I do to reduce the swelling? And then that reduces the pain. Because remember, pain is a voice. Pain has a purpose. It's there to tell you, this is what I want you to do. And what you're looking for is response. So it's very important to listen. Well, the good news is with the lady at the health school, when her husband came in and saw his wife sitting there smiling and by that time we're all laughing, oh, he breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> he just wanted to see his wife happy. And they stayed for the rest of the health school. But it was a great illustration of what to do in a certain situation. And it also showed this lady when her knee gets her in the middle of the night, she doesn't need to walk the, the forest. She, she didn't want to wake her husband and she was crying and walking in the forest. And the walking in the forest would have irritated the knee a little bit more, but she didn't know what to do. All she has to do now is get that bowl of cold water and that washer and just keep alternating it until the swelling goes, or the heat goes down, because there wasn't actually swelling because it was just all bone, but I could feel that heat right inside. And she might just do that for 15 minutes. Now the swelling's going down and she can slip back into bed. So it's just showing people or giving people skills on what they can do for, for different situations. So never forget the ice. So for an overactive thyroid gland, now this morning we looked at an underactive thyroid gland. Do you remember what you put on the underactive thyroid gland? Game pepper. So for an overactive thyroid gland, you put on ice. 
and you put and remember what you do seven seconds on seven seconds off seven seconds on seven seconds off it'll slow down the overactive thyroid glands often called Graves disease and if someone has nodules on their thyroid gland that's where they can use the castor oil compressors so this is a good time to look at water therapy because as we look at the water therapy you can see how you can use it in conjunction with with poultices. Can a pregnant woman use the castor oil on her stomach? Can a pregnant woman use castor oil on her stomach? Well, I wonder why she would use the castor oil. Oh, I have a friend actually who has um, cystic trouble. Okay, so if there's cystic, if there's cystic, if there's cystic trouble, um, the castor oil can be used because the castor oil will only break up unnatural formations, and the developing baby is not an unnatural formation. Remember Psalm 104 verse 14, that God gave herbs for the service of man. Menson calls it synergism, working with the, the needs of the body. Every home should have ice. Every home should have ice cubes in their, in their, uh, in their freezer because it's such, a, such an incredible uh, tool for inflammation. Yes? Carpal tunnel, the best thing for carpal tunnel to, to, to break up those uh, fibrousy areas is castor oil. So my husband's father and grandfather in their 60s, the, the ligaments in their hands started to tighten and so they'd get this claw formation so both his father and his grandfather's hands were like this by the time they got in their 80s so when my husband when he's in his late 50s we started to see it so I used to just massage his hand with castor oil every night and uh, it's never happened it, it stopped that stopped that shrinking up so carpal tunnel excellent for that um, sometimes people have um, an operation for carpal tunnel but uh, Remember what Dr. Kellogg did? He would do everything possible. And he was an excellent surgeon, but he rarely did surgery because he knew it's far better to work with the body and bring about healing because surgery is quite brutal. And I do, I do acknowledge that sometimes surgery may be necessary. A lady said she had a fibroid in her uterus so large that it was blocking her colon. I said, well, I think you better have surgery because if you block your colon, you're not going to live long. So then, but if, you, if, if you'd come to us a year before, then uh, we could have shown you how to balance the hormones and use a castor oil compress to little by little bring that fibroid down. So it is true, there might be a time when surgery is necessary, but remember Dr. Kellogg, he did everything possible before, before he would go to surgery. <coughs> Would castor oil be good for gallstones and kidney stones? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can get um, wraps to go around the torso with Velcro strips that can hold, can hold it in place, hold the poultices in place. So your gallstones, your liver and your gallbladder is under your right rib. For your kidney stones, the kidney stones are at the back and, or your kidneys are at the back and uh, Two-thirds of your kidney sits under your rib and then the top third of your kidney is back up under your rib. So it's, it's in that area there that you would apply it. And remember the key is consistency. Every day, every day you, you apply it. If someone's kidneys are like failing them, they might be going under dialysis. Is there any one of these things that would help? So if someone's kidneys are failing, they're going on dialysis. We have had several people be able to about to go on dialysis and they have not needed to go on dialysis. So there are herbs and I'm sure when you go through your herbal class in the next few months um, you'll be looking at some herbs that are specific for kidneys but some of the best herbs for kidneys are celery and parsley and also corn silk. So when you get organic corn save your silk, dry it and, and you can make that into corn silk tea. Yes? Is there anything you can do for a gangling cyst? For a gangling cyst, uh, the castor oil. You can use the castor oil. Cyst. Or massage or both? 
Uh, well, a compress just allows more castor oil to go in. And if you do massage it, you're going to be massaging for about 10 minutes because it's so sticky. But the only oil that goes in is actually what you massage in. But if you can put a compress on, then you've, it's just a vehicle to hold the castor oil so that more castor oil can go, can go into you. Well, I think we'll have a break now. It's 10 past 7. And we'll come back at half past 7. And when we come back, we're going to look at some other... Um, hydrotherapy treatments you can do.